In the last lecture, we looked at different ways to parallelize our program, and we looked at different parallel programming patterns that are in use today. In today's lecture, we're going to look at the scalability of parallel programs. That is, we're going to look at how we can quantify how well our parallel program is performing. So here is just an outline. Uh, we're first going to look at scalability, and we're going to look at what it is and how we measure it. And then we will look at two simple models or laws that are very well known in uh, parallel programming, and that is Amdahl's law and Gustafsson's law, and we'll look at how they deal with scalability. Finally, we'll look at load, the load imbalance factor. This is a way that we can quantify load imbalance. Remember, load imbalance is something that we came across in the last lecture. Okay, and as usual, where you see a little cream arrow in the top right-hand corner, um, you will see the name of a practical linked to the material being discussed in that slide. So now we're going to talk about performance metrics. When we think about how well a code is performing, we think in terms of the execution time. That is, we measure how long it takes to run. And of course, typically you want T, the execution time, to be as small as possible. Uh, you want your code to run as fast as possible. But there are different measures that we can look at when we um, talk about running our code on more than one processor. So here, P is the number of processors, and N is just the number, of, say, of your your problem size. So it just quantifies the, the problem that you're giving your code um, to work on. So one of the things that comes up a lot in parallel programming when you're looking at um, the performance of your code is the speed up. And so speed up is how, how much faster is your code going. So if on one processor, p equals 1, your code takes, say, uh, one minute, you would hope that when you run your code on two processors, uh, you, you get perfect speed up, i.e. that it should take uh, should take half the amount of time, therefore it should be um, twice as fast. So the speed up should be um, 2. Um, and the formula for working that out is t of n of 1, that is the time it takes to run your problem size n on one processor, uh, divided by the time it takes to run the same problem on p processors. And of course, typically, like I said, uh, you would, in the ideal case, expect the speed up to uh, double if you run on twice as many processes, or triple if you run on three times as many processes, but typically what we see is that s is less than the number of processes, so less than p. Another measure closely related to the speed up is the parallel efficiency, and this is just the speed up divided by the number of processes, and again, if you had 100% efficiency, then e would be equal to 1, but typically what we see is that e is less than 1. There is another measure called the serial efficiency, which doesn't often get discussed, but is very important. So for example, if uh, we want to parallelize our serial code, let's say we have some code and it has an excellent serial algorithm, but in order to parallelize the code, we would need to revert to a simpler, perhaps less efficient algorithm. So uh, T best would be the time it takes to run, uh, your, to run your serial code on a problem size N with the with the very efficient algorithm divided by the time it would take to run the same problem um, on your parallel code but on one processor. Now you might think that these should be the same but that's not necessarily the case um, if there is a change in algorithm for example. So speed up isn't everything because for example your parallel code you know it could run on one processor say and take one minute and then uh, running on two processors it might take half a minute so there you would get that the speed up is two and it's ideal which is excellent but then uh, T best could be 10 seconds. So the, the efficiency, the serial efficiency, would then be 10 seconds divided by uh, 60 seconds. So it would be a third, which is not great. So, so sometimes we have to consider the serial efficiency of our code as well as the parallel efficiency. OK, so what do we mean when we talk about scalability or when we talk about scaling? Scaling is how the performance of a parallel application changes as the number of processes is increased. So what does your code do? How well does it perform? What is the execution time as you increase the number of processes? And what you will find is that there are actually two types of scaling that get discussed. One is strong scaling. So in strong scaling, remember that um, that letter N, which quantifies or, or symbolizes your problem size. When the total problem size stays the same and all we're doing is changing the number of processes, we're increasing the number of processes, that's called strong scaling. So how does your code behave? when the problem size is fixed and you're just running it on more and more and more processes. 
Weak scaling um, is less obvious than strong scaling. Strong scaling is sort of the, the obvious definition of scaling. Weak scaling is a little bit less obvious because here what we do is as we increase the number of processes, we're also increasing the problem size. So in this case, n doesn't stay fixed. It increases with the number of processes. It increases with p. And we do this because we want to keep the amount of work per processor the same. That might sound a bit cryptic now. It will become clear later on as we discuss Gustafsson's law. But these are the two different ways that we... Uh, think about scaling when we're looking at the parallel performance of our code. So generally speaking, strong scaling is, is more useful, it's more intuitive, it's more obvious, but generally speaking, it's more difficult to achieve than weak scaling, um, and we'll see that later on. So here's an example graph of strong scaling, and note that on the y-axis we have the speed up, and on the x-axis we have the number of processes. And you see two lines here, you see um, two curves rather. You see the ideal curve, which is just a straight line. So that line actually is x equals y. So again, reiterating, if we have twice as many processes working on the same size problem, we would expect uh, the speed up to be um, twice as much. And that's what that straight line shows. So that's our ideal. But typically what you see is that um, with strong scaling, the performance of your code tails off. So you see this tail off. And if we have a look at the numbers a little bit, we can see that around about 256 processors, uh, the speed up is about 128. So if we talk about the parallel efficiency, that's only about 50% efficiency. So it really doesn't seem worth scaling this problem or running this problem, this code, on um, more than 256 processors because your efficiency is only going to get worse. And you can see this from the, the tail off um, of this curve. And you see this tail off because if you think about it, when you keep the problem size fixed, the amount of work that each processor is doing as you increase the number of processes is less and less. So as processors are doing less work, you start to feel the parallel overhead. Um, well, you start to feel the parallel overhead, so overheads in communication. Um, and, um, and this is what causes um, this tail off. Here is an example of weak scaling. This is quite a different graph um, from strong scaling. So again, here we plot instead of the speed up, we run, uh, we plot the runtime, and we plot it against the no against the number of processors. And what we see is that the ideal weak scaling, well, the, the ideal curve that we want is actually this very flat line. And that might seem counterintuitive, but if we think about it, remember what I said earlier that with weak scaling we're increasing n with the number of processes. So what we're doing by doing that is we're keeping the amount of work that each processor has to do fixed. Now if we keep the amount of work that each processor has to do the same, then we would expect the runtime not to change as we increase the number of processes because they're all running in parallel. But typically what happens in real life is that we see this, again, this tail off where actually the runtime doesn't stay the same as you increase the number of processes. You have communication overheads, for example, which increases the, the runtime. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit more detail about what's actually going on, and we're going to discuss Jean Amdahl's law. So Jean Amdahl came up with this in 1967, and he found that the performance improvement to be gained by parallelization is limited by the proportion of the code which is serial. So in this diagram here, we can see that we've got our code, see on the far left column, that's our total code, the black part and the white part, and we've divided it. So 50% is serial, that's the black part of, uh, of the column, and 50% is potentially parallelizable, that's the white part of the column. And we're going to assume, for the sake of argument, that the part of the code that is parallelizable is 100% parallelizable, okay? So we would expect IDs, ideal scaling from that part of the code. Now, running on one processor, we see that the serial part of the code takes, well, say, one second, and the, the parallel part, or in, in this instance, of course, it's not parallelized, but the parallel part also takes one second. So that's a total runtime of two seconds. Now, if we run this, uh, uh, we parallelize our code, and if we run it on two processors, we see that, of course, the serial part is unaffected by the, par uh, the, the fact that we're running it on more than one processor. But, of course, the parallel part of the code um, is now uh, has ideal scaling, and therefore it has a speed up of 2, so it takes half a second, so it's half as long to run. So the total runtime is one second from the serial part, plus half a second from the parallel part, so that's one and a half seconds, and of course remember the formula for speed up, the, we just divide the time it takes on p processors 
so t sorry, the time it takes on uh, running on one processor divided by the time it takes on p processors. So that is um, two divided by one and a half, which gives us four over three, which is one point three three. So that's our speed up, and we can just carry on like this, and we can work out the speed up. And you see that actually we're running on eight processors, but the speed up here is just one point eight. And what we find um, is that actually. If we idealize and we go to, say, a very, very large number of processes, so large that actually the parallel part takes zero seconds, we are limited by the serial part of the code, that no matter how small we make that parallel part, no matter how fast it goes, i.e. we could make it so fast that it basically takes no time whatsoever, the runtime will still be one second. So in this case, if we have this ideal case where um, the parallel part takes zero seconds, the speed up, the maximum possible speed up that we can get is of course then 2 seconds divided by 1 second which is 2 and you can see that um, the speed up as we have increased the number of processes is tending towards 2. So Amdahl's law says that we are limited by the serial part of the code and that's what we see with the numbers. Going to, into a little bit more detail, um, if we think of the fraction of the code as alpha um, that's the part of the code that we absolutely cannot parallelize, and we, if we think of the potentially parallelizable sections as 1 minus alpha, and again, as I said earlier, we're assuming that the parallel part is 100% efficient, so we can get ideal scaling from that part of the code, we find that the parallel runtime Tn of p is just alpha Tn of 1 plus 1 minus alpha T of n of 1 divided by p. And uh, similarly, you can work out that the parallel speed up using the formula we, we came across earlier just ends up being p over alpha p plus 1 minus alpha. And you can see from this uh, formula that for very, very large p, uh, the speed up tends to 1 over alpha. So if we had no serial part in the code, i.e. alpha was 0, so the, the, the entire code was 100% parallelizable, we can see that we get ideal scaling, we get s equals p, so it's 100% efficiency. Otherwise, we see that the speed up is limited by 1 over alpha, as we saw in the previous example. So if, for example, 10% of our code is um, serial, we see that uh, the maximum possible speed up we can get is 1 over alpha, that is, it's 10, so we can only ever get um, a speed up of 10, which means that running that code on more than 10 processes is really pointless. Um, if we look at, for example, 16 processes or 1,024, we see that uh, as we increase the number of processes, we are tending towards that maximum speed up. So this is Amdahl's law, and, and, and Amdahl was, you know, was quite negative in the sense that he said, well, okay, this means that basically you're going to have a problem. So if you, you know, if you have even, um, even if 1% of your code is um, serial, then you're only ever going to be able to run on a whole 100 processes, and running on more than 100 processes will be pointless. Um, so that's a problem, because of course, uh, like Archer, for example, um, parallel machines, HPC machines, have hundreds of thousands, of course. So does Amdahl's law mean that we can't actually utilize these machines? Well, as Gustafsson showed, actually, he found that, no, that's not the case. That's not what actually happens. As you have larger and larger machines, you tend to, to run larger and larger problems. And if it, that, that's what, re, what realistically happens. So it's not the case that we keep our problem size fixed, as Amdahl's law um, assumes, but actually we scale our problem size with the number of processes we're, working, uh, uh, we're running our code on. And if we do this, we find that actually the speed up is much better. And because we're scaling the problem size with the number of processes, we find that... Um, we get much better speed up and we find that actually uh, there is no real limitation because what we're doing is we're scaling up the parallel part of the code um, and therefore the serial part is much much less limiting. In fact it's not a limit at all as we will see. So this is Gustafsson's law and this law is related to weak scaling. Remember we said that weak, weak scaling the problem size scales with the number of processes. So okay in this slide there's a, there's a lot of maths and I, I don't want to uh, get bogged down in the details but Basically, the key thing to take away with Gustafsson's law is that we assume that the parallel part of the code is proportional to n. So that's uh, the problem size. And we, we assume that the serial part uh, is independent of n. Um, so if we were to work out the time that the code takes uh, for a problem size n on p processes, we, we know that it's made up of a serial part and a t parallel part. And if you notice here, you've got alpha times t11. So t11 is the time it takes to run on one processor uh, and to run on some unit, 
smallest unit size of works a uh, problem size so n equals one let's say and you notice that's the serial part um, of the execution time and that is independent of n but unlike Amdahl's law if you look at the next part the next term t parallel you see that this is proportional to n and if we do the maths and we work out the speed up we find that it's this 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 uh, formula alpha plus one mi minus alpha times n divided by <coughs> alpha plus one minus alpha n over p and um, we find that that is the formula for the speeder. So if we have a look at this a little bit more, if we set that n equals p, uh, so n the problem size is proportional in some by some constant factor to the number of processes, we find that the speed up simplifies to a formula alpha plus one minus alpha times p. So we don't have this one over alpha term as we did in Amdahl's law. So we can see that. Um, as long as we keep increasing uh, the number of processes, so as long as we increase p, that the speed up will carry on increasing, and that there is no limiting factor. So the serial part of the code does not limit the speed up. Furthermore, unlike in the uh, in the strong scaling model uh, in Amdahl's law, where remember we had this one over alpha for the speed up. So if you were to work out the efficiency, that's one over alpha divided by p. Um, and if you uh, increase the number of processes, you would actually get that the efficiency goes all the way down to zero. In the case of um, Gustafsson's law, we have alpha over p, so that term would go to zero as the p increases, but you have this fixed term 1 minus alpha for the efficiency. So that suggests that the efficiency um, remains finite, it doesn't go all the way to zero as it does for Amdahl's law. So. If you increase the amount of work done by each parallel task, um, as you do in Gustafsson's, uh, looking when you're looking at Gustafsson's law, or in the case of weak scaling, uh, then the serial component doesn't dominate. So we want to increase the problem size to maintain good scaling, and you can do this by either actually increasing the overall size of the problem. So if you have a grid and you increase the size of the grid, um, say if you have a ten by ten grid and you increase it to a hundred by a hundred. Um, that would be one way of increasing n. Uh, another way to do it is to increase the complexity. So you're increasing the amount, remember, the amount of work that each processor has to do. Um, and you can do that by increasing the complexity or the size of the problem. So here's just a little table where we're looking at 16 processors and 1024. And we look at both strong scaling, that is Amdahl's law, and weak scaling, that is Gustafsson's law. And we can see that if you work out the numbers, uh, in the strong scaling case, um, the speed up is really tending towards a value 10, whereas in the weak scaling case, it just keeps on increasing. And that's what we would expect. Okay, so I just want to go through a nice analogy um, to make clear these two different ways to quantify scaling, so strong scaling and weak scaling. So let's say we want to fly from London to New York. In fact, let's be a bit more specific. Let's say that we want to fly from Buckingham Palace to the Empire State Building. Okay, so uh, we're going to fly in a jumbo jet, that, and we're going to fly a distance of 5,600 kilometers at a speed of about 700 kilometers per hour. How long does that take? Well, that takes about eight hours. And so that's our total journey time, right? Well, actually, no, that is not our total journey time. That's just the flight time. Because, of course, we need to get from Buckingham Palace, we need to get to the airport, and we need some time to check in and, and go through. And then at the other end, at the Empire State Building, we, of course, need to leave the airport. We need to get through immigration. And then we need to take a, a taxi downtown, say, from the airport. So there are fixed overheads. And, we, and let's say, for example, that uh, those fixed overheads in total come up to four hours. So our total journey time is actually four hours of overhead time plus the eight hour flight times so that is 12 hours in total okay so how do we improve on this well let's triple the flight speed with uh, a concorde so let's say we're flying on a on a concorde which is 2100 kilometers per hour so now the flight time only takes two hours 40 minutes but of course the overhead time the time that we spend in the airport or, or getting from the airport to downtown um, new york is the same so We've got four hours again, plus two hours, 40 minutes. So even though our total journey time has decreased, we still have this four, four hour overhead. So now the total journey time is 6.7 hours. And we can work out the speed up of our total travel time. And um, it's 1.8. And it's not three. Even though we are tripling the flight speed with uh, Concorde, 
our speed up is of course much less than that because of course we have this serial part of our journey, this overhead, right? These four hours that cannot be parallelized in any way or sped up in any way. And that's Amdahl's law. So if we think of alpha, the serial fraction of our journey as four over 12, as four, as the four hours, so um, alpha equals four over 12, um, that's 0 0.33. And remember, this, the maximum possible speed up we can get is one over alpha. We see that the maximum possible speed up is three, i.e. four hours. So the maximum possible speed up will give us a total journey time of four hours, i.e. if our flight time was zero hours and all we had was the overhead time in the airports. So this is a nice illustration of Amdahl's law. Okay, well let's now take the same analogy and think about Gustafsson's law. So now, remember in Gustafsson's law, what you did was you increased the problem size. So in this case, we're going to increase the distance that we're going to travel. That's our problem size, and we're going to increase that. So now we're not flying f from uh, London to Sid uh, London to um, New York. We're going from London to Sydney. So specifically, let's say we're going from Buckingham Palace to the Sydney Opera House. And if we do the same calculation, so what is our flight time? Well, we're going in a jumbo jet, so we're traveling now 16,800 kilometers, at ag again at 700 kilometers per hour. So our flight time ends up being 24 hours. Of course, the serial overhead stays the same. So that is the serial overhead, you know, the time that we spend in the airport, going through immigration, etc., checking in, is four hours. So in total, the journey time is 28 hours. Okay, well, what uh, what happens again if we fly by Concord? So, so we're tripling the flight speed. Um, so now the flight time is just eight hours. So the total journey time now takes 12 hours. And if we work out the speed up, this is actually 2.3 uh, for the speed up because of course we've increased the distance that we're traveling so this is a much better speed up than the speed up we got when we were traveling to New York because we've made our problem size bigger and that is of course Gustafsson's law bigger problems scale better and they scale better because they make the serial part of the uh, problem seem insignificant so if we increase both the distance i.e. n and the maximum speed i.e. the number of processes that we use by three we get this um, better speed up Okay, so that's just a nice way of thinking about Amdahl's and Gustafsson's law, and hopefully that will give you a more intuitive feel for what's going on. To finish off this lecture, I just want to talk about quantifying load imbalance. So we've talked about load imbalance. We've talked about uh, load imbalance where each processor is not doing the same amount of work. So, so far, when we're talking about Amdahl's law and Gustafsson's law and, and scaling and scalability, we, we don't really talk about how much work each processor is doing. We assume that they are all equally busy. But what happens if some processor runs out of work? Okay, well, let's go with an example to make this clearer. So you have four people packing boxes with cans of soup. So it takes each person, no matter who they are, one minute to pack a box. So, uh, of course, if we gave this task to one person, we've got 12 boxes that need to, to be packed. If we gave this task to one person to do, i.e. if it was uh, serially done, then um, they would take 12 minutes. But let's say we've got four people and we're going to distribute the 12 boxes across four people, Anna, Paul, David and Helen. But we don't distribute the boxes evenly, as you might expect. We instead give Anna six boxes, Paul one box, David three boxes and Helen two. So how long is it going to take to pack all 12 boxes? Well, of course, um, whoever has the, the greatest number of boxes will take the longest amount of time because everyone's working at the same rate. So in this case, Anna is going to take six minutes, which is longer than anyone else. So everyone has to wait for Anna to finish the six boxes. So the, the time to finish packing 12 boxes is actually six minutes because everyone is going to be waiting for Anna. Now, if we gave everyone the same number of boxes, which is what you might think is the obvious thing to do and is the right thing to do, uh, that is if we gave everyone four boxes, sorry, three boxes each, 12 divided by four, uh, four is three, um, then of course everyone would take three minutes to pack their three boxes and that would be the uh, time it takes to pack 12 boxes. And that, of course, is um, the time that we want, because in that case, uh, the load or the work that each person doing is the same, i.e. we have load balance if everyone had three boxes. Um, but if we think about scalability, well, okay, so in the first instance, we if we gave the 12 boxes to one person, it would take them 12 minutes. Um, if we distribute the work unevenly, um, as in the example, um, the time takes six minutes. So we've got four people, I think of it as four processes, um, and the total time would be six minutes. So if we work out the speed up, that would be 12 divided by six, which is two. 
um, for four processes. So if we work out the parallel efficiency, that's two divided by four, which gives us 50% efficiency. So that's not great. So thinking about scalability is not everything, um, because here clearly, if we had distributed our work evenly amongst all the people, we would have um, much better efficiency. We'd have three minutes, we'd have 12 divided by three, which would give us um, ideal scaling of four. So the take home message is we want to make the best use of the processes at hand before increasing the number of processes, right? We want to make the maximum use of each processor and we want all the processes to be working equally hard. So how do we quantify this? Well, you can quantify this by thinking about the maximum load divided by the average load and this is called the load imbalance factor. So if we think in our previous example, the maximum load was six, the average load of course was three, and if we do six divided by three, we get uh, a load imbalance factor of two. So for a perfectly balanced problem, i.e. if everyone had three boxes, you would do three, which would be then the maximum load divided by three, which would give you one. So if you have a perfectly balanced um, problem, your load imbalance factor should be one. But in general, we see that the load imbalance factor is greater than one, as we just worked out for the problem. So six divided by three, that, that's two. And what, what the uh, load imbalance factor tells you, it tells you how much faster your calculation could be um, if your problem was, uh, if, if your processes were all balanced and they had um, the same amount of work. So again, going back to the example, our load imbalance factor was two, and of course we had uh, an execution time of six minutes, so we know that um, we can half uh, the time it takes to finish that task um, if uh, we balanced our load evenly across all the people doing the work. And of course that, that is what we've seen. If we do um, if we do our best time, we do uh, to work out our best time, we'll do six minutes divided by two, which gives us three minutes. Okay? And that's what we saw, that if we had evenly distributed the number of boxes across all four people, it would have just taken three minutes. So the load imbalance factor is a nice way to quantify um, how well... Uh, balanced <laughs> our, our, our problem is. Okay, so in in summary, uh, there are some key performance metrics um, that we should consider. Of course, the, the main one is execution time, but there are different ways that we can use that um, execution time um, when we're thinking about running our code on one processor or many processors and, and work out other metrics, for example, the speed up or the parallel efficiency or even the serial efficiency. Now scaling is important, um, as, as the more a code scales, the larger a machine it can take advantage of. For example, consider a weak and strong scaling. Strong scaling is typically much harder um, to achieve. In practice we have overheads that limit the scalability of real programs. Um, and Amdahl's law models these in terms of serial and parallel fractions, whereas Gustafsson's law models uh, scalability in terms of larger problem sizes as you uh, run your problem on more processors. And so larger problems generally scale better with Gustafsson's law. And, of course, that it's not all about scalability. It's also about how much each processor is working and um, how well loaded each processor is and more to the point that all your processors are, are working equally hard. And that's where the load imbalance factor comes in and it's a good way to look at the load balance of your problem. So these metrics exist to give you an indication of how well your code performs and scales and they get used a lot and they're and they're a very good indication of how well our parallel code is performing.